Oh, hello, welcome to another Café Rollist. Uh, uh, my hair is much tidier than usual because I'm coming out of a job interview. But now, I'm not the one being interviewed. John here is the one being interviewed. John, could you in briefly introduce yourself? Sure. My name is John Hodgson. I am the owner and I suppose managing director of Handiwork Games. You may also know my work from uh, many years in illustration, working on things such as the One Ring role-playing game, uh, oof, Warhammer Fantasy role-play, Dungeons and Dragons, done a few World of Warcraft cards, lots of L5R cards, all that kind of stuff. Um, but but uh, mostly now I am um, managing my own company, Handiwork Games. Fantastic. Uh, we got a couple of ice-breaking questions with uh, Café Rolis, which is a, a spin-off show born out of COVID. Uh, what is your routine like at the moment? And is it impacted in any way by the, the ongoing uh, Panini? Yeah, we, we call it Panini. We're going to uh, listen to Jamie from uh, Once More Into the Void. Uh, we, we think that the Panini is a much better word uh, to mention that thing. Yeah, it's nice, it's nice to get a bit of variation, isn't it? We've all heard the official word too many times. Um, yeah, really, really disappointingly, my routine is almost entirely unaffected. I've worked from home for 20 years or something, so it, it, it can feel a bit strange to not be undergoing this huge change in, in circumstance. Um, so, yeah, my, my routine remains much as it ever was. So what, what, what's my average day like? I kind of usually up around seven do some emails all that jazz and i've got two boys and we get them off to school and then i do a little bit of a walk just to stretch my legs and clear the cobwebs and then i'm in work for usually about half nine and i work through till about six um yeah i've got a really great team i work with which is awesome we all work remotely which is kind of cool and interesting um in these times we've all kept each other sane i think um and then i'll often do a bit of an evening shift i still do freelance um, artwork for games that i want to work on um in the evening so yeah keep at, the mo at the moment you don't have your home office being crowded with your children or your wife would be working from home as well no no i'm very very lucky when i first set up my home office i mean i kind of the home office predates my kids which is sort of that's really helpful right so you're not trying to push them out of a space that they already feel entitled to and I was really strict with the kids about that my office is, is my workplace and they weren't allowed in it, basically, which I'm really nice to my kids, unless that sounds horrible, if that sounds horrible, but they're not allowed in the workspace. And now I'm very fortunate and I've got a, a garden office now where I'm broadcasting from now. It's a very nice oh, wow. space. To, Jealous. Yeah. As a Londoner, I don't have this type of luxury. <laughs> oh, I would be yeah, very space. rich. <laughs> Yeah, well, yeah, if you had room to do a garden office, you could just sell the plot, couldn't you, and retire or something, yeah. So tell yeah, me, but... was Beowulf, uh, Age of Heroes, born in the shed <laughs> of your garden? I think it predates the, the shed. <laughs> it's a very expensive shed, let me tell you. Uh, it, yeah, it predates it by about a year, I think. So, no, it was not born in this room i am in now but um yeah it's it's a lot of the work has happened here yes so definitely yeah. so oh was it born uh, i mean i mean first of all to for my listeners who might be from uh, around the world uh one thing i find mm. funny with beowulf is that when you engage with uh english speakers uh nat native english speakers beowulf is is the thing and it's self-evident and they okay. always mention it like it's right. as a re matter of fact, and everybody knows Beowulf in details. Uh, yeah. In the French speaking world, Beowulf, I don't even know what it's called in French if, or if it's just called Beowulf, but I, I was not really aware of that story with this big classic before I engaged more with the English speaking world. So, what is it actually? So, it's the, it's the oldest. Um, poem in the written English language and that's that's a bit of a cheat because it was written in old English which is really an entirely different language I mean obviously related to modern English but um very very difficult to read you, you won't get very far as if you can unless you can 
speak old English. It's been translated down the years by many, many different people, most famously perhaps um, J.R. Tolkien, Seamus Heaney, um, and more recently Maria Devana Headley is, is uh, getting a lot of attention with her very modern um, interpretation of it, which is really cool, really good. I've got a copy back there somewhere. Um, yeah, so but it's an epic poem written by the historical Anglo-Saxon people. That's a term I like to be careful with now, um, Anglo-Saxon. It doesn't, it's nothing to do with ideas of, of so-called race in inverted commas. It's, it's, it's a historical people who, who moved to the British Isles um, around the middle of the first century um, AD, first, sorry, first millennium in the middle of the first millennium AD. I always say first century. I don't know why. I've spent years studying this thing and I always get that wrong. I don't know why my brain's broken, I think. Um, and uh, yeah, they, they um, around, it's thought around 1000 AD, CE, depending on how you want to reckon it. Um, it was written down, but it, it's supposed to, it's reckoned to have had an earlier history as, as part of the oral culture and it harkens back to the adventures of, of Beowulf who is a prince of Denmark basically who is this sort of all singing all dancing adventuring hero type and and what he gets up to um, traveling from from his uh, home in southern Sweden he's from a people called the Geats and he travels to Denmark where he fights a monster called Grendel uh, and then he fights Grendel's mother and then he fights much later, a huge amount of time passes within the narrative. He becomes a king. It's a little bit like Conan, do you know what I mean? He goes yeah. through these different phases. And then he fights a dragon. And uh, I, I always joke about, are we allowed to give spoilers for a thousand year old <laughs> poem? But like, as you say, if you've not read it, it's not, yeah, I don't want to spoil it for anyone, but it is an epic sort of tragic poem about heroism and what it means to be a good person to the people living in anglo-saxon times um it's got a lot of tension between the incoming religion of christianity and the sort of the older you know religion of the anglo-saxons the, the so-called pagan or heathen religion of, of the anglo-saxons is sort of being digested through through the poem of beowulf it's it's got a strongly christian slant but you can see the roots of, of older belief in there and and the people sort of digesting that change um, but there's lots in there. Now, why a lot of British people recognise it is it was taught for many, many years as kind of something you had to know if you did higher education. You know, if you went on beyond school to study English literature, you were kind of forced to study Beowulf. Um, a lot of people found it very boring because you had to translate the old English. Um, and it was very much, it was used in, in quite a lot of ways to sort of um, talk about British history and so on. It was quite quite dull. Tolkien very much um, reinvigorated discussion around Beowulf with his translation and recognizing that it is really it's an adventure story, and it's a really exciting adventure story. It's great. It's really good. I really like the idea that okay, so you're gonna learn literature in English literature. So let's yeah. start with this very geeky and somewhat. I mean, I don't want to play down, but you know, it sounds a bit like yeah, like really yeah. a piece of entertainment rather than uh, you know, it doesn't sound exactly right, like yeah. my Beth, Macbeth. <laughs> yeah, it is. You know, it's. Um... But it's, I think it got a, a sort of stuffy reputation because they tried to play down the fact that dude <laughs> fighting a dragon, you know, and. It was Tolkien. Again, Tolkien wrote this really brilliant essay about it where, yeah, because again, it was tried, to, it was attempts were used to make it a historical work, but there's like, there's a dragon in it, you know, so you could only go so far with that. And, and Tolkien was sort of instrumental in pointing out that this is a, uh, something different. It's not a historical work. The, while some of the, some of the places and people are definitely real, you know, we have records of some of the names from the historical record. So it's, yeah, you know, which again is really exciting that there's this mixture of this sort of fantastic tale, but real people who we have evidence for come up in it in passing. Um, it also has something else I really love about it because it was written down by, we think at least Anglo-Saxon kind of scribes living in the British Isles, but harking back to their sort of ancestral history in mainland Europe, sort of half forgotten ancestor age in sort of Denmark, Southern Sweden. Um, it's got this real, it's almost like in a galaxy far, far away. Yeah. Or like funny you mentioned Macbeth, you know how Hamlet is happening in Denmark, but it's not really Denmark, right? It just means over there, away, you know, <laughs> uh, 
somewhere else and that lets you something we do in the game that, that gives you a lot of um freedom to sort of mess around with with the, the setting the de facto setting of kind of this mythic um saxon northern europe you know so you can you can do a lot with it because well because it's not historical you know it's, it's uh, i love and, and <laughs> I love paintings from the 15th century, especially when they, they show scenes from the Bible and it's like the gate of Jerusalem or on the way to Bethlehem and it's a lush Western European forest with a little yeah, castle yeah, exactly. and <laughs> because people had absolutely no clue. Uh, I'm an urban designer and there's a historical f uh, case of the, the first picture we have of New York when it was New Amsterdam. I think it was made by a French yeah. and he just drew it. He'd never been there. He was asked, can you go to New, right. New Amsterdam and make a picture of it? And he was like, sure, right. And he just didn't go. He drew something. <laughs> and when people complained about it way, way later, he just said, yeah, you know, I look, I drew what people expected. And, and, and funnily yeah. enough, what yeah. people expected also is that when the Dutch arrived, I mean, uh, it's a tangent, but when the Dutch went to New York, well, what would be New Amsterdam and then New York, they, they were planning to do a Dutch city. So they had the plan, you get the right. planning thing already done mm. and they were supposed to do the channels and so on, like a, a copy of, uh, of Amsterdam oh, right. and so yeah. on. Uh, not a copy, copy, but the same principles. And when yeah. the people arrived there, they realized that the topography, the conditions, no, no, none of that would make uh, zero right. sense yeah, yeah. to do. So they just didn't do it, but they didn't tell it so for a while. They even had a plan thinking, oh, that's that's how they built it. They were like, yeah, yeah, right, right. I sent you a letter. I said, it's it's done. <laughs> don't worry. Don't worry about it. It's some tea, it's some whatever. Don't don't worry about it. And yeah, and, and the other thing is we I recorded a film studies about the, the name of the rose and playing mm. uh, in historical settings. And what I find fascinating, especially when we... Uh, we talk about ancient history like that. Uh, we have actually zero clue what it was like, and all the yeah, stories right. yeah, yeah. we tell are a bunch of uh, nonsense. I mean, I, I love the story of the fall of Troy and this sort of things, but mm -hmm. did it happen? Yeah. So uh, Beowulf. Yeah. <laughs> I love the idea that that just jumping back a little bit to when you're talking about people, you know, drawing biblical scenes, and it all looks like medieval, what we call medieval scenes, which because they didn't. <laughs> They didn't think of themselves as being medieval, right? They were just, it's just <laughs> now. Um, but, but I love that this idea, and I'm, I'm absolutely making this up, but this idea that they didn't really see history or the passage of time like we do. And that's a modern idea, you know, with every sense of the word modern, almost modernist idea that time moves forward and progress happens inevitably progress happens. Whereas, of course, medieval people are living in a time where they're a little bit closer to these huge you know, empires that are no longer there, but but we don't really know. What did, they, you know, what did they think of, you know, have you seen the paintings of like Rome being sort of recolonized by medieval people? Yeah. And they've built like a shack in the shadow of this like aqueduct. <laughs> and it's like, that that's that's your lot, mate. That's what you've achieved. And you, I'm absolutely fascinated by that. What did they think it was? You know, what did, what? how did they view these things that they couldn't build or didn't want to build? Yeah. I mean, like, hey, we talk about it in the beginning of Beowulf. Historically, I find it absolutely fascinating that for a very long time, relatively speaking, you know, the Anglo-Saxons colonize the British Isles after the Romans have departed, more or less. You know, there's enormous amount you can say about that. But Roman London, as the sort of civic center of, of Roman Britain, was just abandoned, pretty much whole cloth. And the Anglo-Saxons didn't they didn't move in and, and carry it on as a city. They had no use for it. Um, and there's this big gap in the archaeological record where there's almost no Saxon finds in London for, you know, 100 years or so, is it? Um, something like that, because they just they were they lived a different kind of life. You know, they were all very much based around family groups, agricultural family groups, a sort of warrior culture that, that the Romans didn't share. And I it's just brilliant. What did they think, though, this huge relatively speaking huge city built in you know a lot of stone buildings what well, they were just like nope what's nope. that all about <laughs> well, don't it's... live there but yeah interesting isn't it? yeah it's fascinating and i can imagine it's a it's a mix of on one hand superstition like oh this the city might be cursed to some extent and no one lives there and on the other end just the practicality of it like okay we yeah. want 
to uh, have a community and we need to sustain it with uh, a bunch of things we need to produce ourselves, uh, which is crops and so on. And if you are yeah. inside or close to that large city, which is London, at the time, uh, well, you're like, well, it's a pain to cultivate. What am I supposed to do? I cannot, I'm not going to bother yeah, well, yeah, a... tear down that building yeah. to change it into crops. I'm going to go to a field which is empty. It makes much more sense. Well, it's quite interesting. Is it? If, if you get rich now, you go and live in the country, don't you, on a farm? Footballers, they all get rich and they go and live on a farm. Well, the Romans did that. that. Well, yeah, that's true, you know, but the, the, the sort of the dislike of city living is, is not entirely wrong either, is it? You know, we can relate to that. Um, but yeah, as you say, you know, the, this division of labor was very different. You, you know, to run a city, you need a lot of division of labor and people doing different specialized jobs. Well, the, the, the Anglo Saxon people, as far as we know, didn't go in for that as much as as the romans certainly did you know so uh yeah they're just different lifestyles yeah people sometimes don't don't realize how much uh, they, 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 often people think materials in architecture is a question of taste and it's it's really it's really a question of uh supply and system and the, the whole concept of mm -hmm. uh and uh, I, I remember a forum seeing uh some uh <laughs> opinionated Britons arguing whether or not the Roman occupation was a good or a bad thing, <laughs> which was a bit, okay, that's an old story, but they were exchanging pictures showing insulae like you find in Rome and say, oh, this yeah. is the housing that the Romans had and this is the housing from the, the, the Anglo-Saxons, which has that roof and more uh, yeah, allegedly yeah, yeah. In, in tune with nature. And it was like, yeah, I don't think you had those buildings in Ro in Londinium because th these are Roman situation. You, you've got this constraint of density. Yeah. Uh, but definitely a thing with the Roman going away is that what well, suddenly you don't have your supply, import and export of uh, terracotta tiles and stone and you don't yeah. send away beers and you exchange through stuff. So suddenly... You need to do everything local, including your materials for your building, and that means doing things I mean, uh, very differently. It's, historically, the the Saxons. I mean, this is nothing to do with Beowulf, really, because it's not historical. Actually, it's, you know, it's like a mythic thing. But I mean, historically, the the Saxons ran into problems because they ran out of coins. You know, the Romans were importing coinage to make the economy, you know, run gold coins, and they, you know, gold became very very scarce, and they moved to silver coinage, and that again, you know, they had a very mixed economy. That, that didn't just rely on coinage because they just didn't have the infrastructure to, to support that. Um, it's really, yeah, it's interesting stuff, isn't it? Yeah, it's nothing to do with our game, though. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So coinage, yeah. if you have silver or gold coins, you should spend them on Beowulf, uh, a setting for 5th yeah. edition, uh, Age of Heroes. So why yeah, should totally people gold. go spend their gold and, and silver coins on uh, that <laughs> fifth edition setting the roman coins that they've got yeah yeah this is my exciting news if anyone is watching who is a backer look at, i can't line that up in the camera at all it's all backwards it's beautiful this is the very first copy of the game uh that has just arrived it is in our german warehouse right now and this is the first one that i seen and it arrived about 10 minutes before i came on air so i've not even had a proper chance to look at it i'll be filming lots of video of me reacting to this oh later. yeah we could do a reaction yeah, video cool. right now like, yeah 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 you would be crying i nearly opened i nearly brought it on air in the box sight unseen but there's always the fear that it's all gone terribly wrong and that wouldn't be great would it but no it's come out beautifully i mean look i don't know if you can see on the screen you see the um spot uv on the cover there's like a design oh wow it's gonna i'm not gonna have yeah there's not gonna be enough light. <laughs> oh yeah i see it light. now there's a sigil yes. of some kind yeah wow. yeah yeah it's not gonna be good there but yeah but yeah no very very happy so what this is all about is it is primarily designed for duet play for fifth edition so one gm and one player oh so really the, yeah, yeah. interesting yep yeah, yep yeah, yep yeah. um so rather than having to wrangle a party of your friends together because we've all been there where that's can be quite challenging and especially now you know i mean those things are starting to open up but much easier to organize a game much easier to keep a game going and a lot of what we've put into this is designed it's a very sort of structured campaign approach that hopefully makes it very easy for you to pick up and put down um and we give the player lots of things to do between sessions as well as the gm so there's, there's player journaling stuff um i mean loads there's loads and loads of stuff in there it's well worth going to handiwork 
games which is our website because you'll get a, a proper rundown of all of it rather than whatever comes to my mind rambling on about it just now but yeah you play the hero class and there are six subclasses within fifth you know fifth edition this is um six subclasses each one for each uh ability score which is pleasingly old school i like to <laughs> think but you could sort of theme your hero based on your different ability scores like strength dexterity wisdom um but because they're subclasses the great thing is you can pick from all of for example the feats for the whole class so you can really tailor your your hero to the way you want to play um and we've built in this one of the things i think we we talk about the most that we're most proud of is uh, followers so every hero has a band of followers with them and they work a little bit like spells that they each follower has some gifts some burdens because some followers are difficult people or you know they have drawbacks but mostly you've got followers because they have gifts that you can basically evoke them to use and they come sort of they come onto the stage from from out of the spotlight they do the thing they do well and then they 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 disappear back into the background again um and obviously you know there's lots of rules around that uh but yeah that's really cool makes it all sort of fifth edition sing for one player because that's stuff like that. yeah. that's really interesting it's the first time i hear of a duet fifth edition uh game mm -hmm. i played my first duet game yesterday actually it was to look confidential oh, okay. Uh, yeah right yeah. but yeah the idea of doing that to something mm -hmm. yeah a bit more dungeon crawly uh yeah i saw you yeah so why actually uh, did did it just make sense with the 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 inspiration for the game beowulf well actually did the idea of making a beowulf game came first of to do a duet fifth mm. edition first yeah Be beowulf came first so um i had spent almost a decade working at a company called Cubicle 7. Uh, we made uh, the One Ring role-playing game, stuff like that. And through my research for all the, all the artwork and background material for that, I, I had come into contact with Beowulf. And, and prior to working on for Cubicle 7 and prior to working for the One Ring, I had spent a long time working for Warhammer Historical. And I really like that early medieval period that just sort of floats my boat as a, as a sort of historical period. I've always been interested in sort of Anglo-Saxons and Vikings and Celts and all that jazz. I love all that. Um, and having moved on from Cubicle 7, I uh, assembled a little team of people and we were looking at what we could, obviously we were going to make a game, we were going to make a role-playing game. Uh, and we basically put our heads together on what we could do well, what we were really interested in, what we knew about. And Beowulf kept coming up as this kind of, we felt there was a gap in the market for a fifth edition, sort of low fantasy early medieval era, you know, sort of Viking-y kind of thing. Um, Be yeah, Beowulf kept coming up. And, th and that, you know, the idea of the singular hero that we see in Beowulf was really tempting as a, you know, can we do a one player, one GM version of 5e? And yes, was the answer. Yes, we can. Um, and uh, yeah, well, I'm very pleased with that, actually. But yeah, it was uh, Beowulf and the setting was the first, the first kind of port of call. I mean, anyone who's familiar with my artwork knows I'm, I'm all about that kind of... Um, early medieval people in mail and round shields is yeah. my thing yeah actually i i played the uh, lone wolf uh, the box set which oh, uh, yeah. we recorded an yeah. actual play of it which i apologize oh, cool. if you're a fan of lone wolf uh, I, I was <laughs> not familiar with lone wolf and I, i'm not sure we gave it the most uh what's the word <laughs> Fair uh, respectful <laughs> treatment <laughs> But we had a, a lot oh, of fun uh, doing it. And I made TikToks yeah. with your art. I hope it's not infringing oh, on okay. uh, well, appropriate not, I don't know. Use. I don't own that. So <laughs> you can go. I, I can neither give permission nor refuse it. It's not, it's not my artwork. That's owned by Cubicle 7. So you have it, to ask them if that's okay. It's very interesting that you, uh, you're doing a duet 5th edition game right now because it mm -hmm. really feels like probably as a result of the pandemic, there's been a, an extensive number of people who were made aware of that type of play. Uh, and since I guess it's slightly easier when you play online than having a, a whole bunch of people. Yep, yep. Um, yeah, I'm seeing a lot of solo, solo RPGs are really on the rise again, aren't they? I'm seeing a lot of that Iron Sworn and so on, really exciting. Um, stuff. I like the. Uh, I definitely like the dynamic between one player and one GM. And it isn't. Do uh, you know something I've I've spoken about a lot around this? It's not meant to replace 
playing D and D with a whole bunch of friends. It's never going to replace that. Yeah, of That's course. its own thing, you know. Um, but but there's a really nice dynamic, and and we kept stumbling across these lovely little parts where, for example, in in the game Beowulf: Age of Heroes, you we've replaced alignment in the traditional sense with your kind of religious alignment as a hero. So either you're of the old ways, so you're like a heathen hero, or you've converted or, or you were born into a Christian tradition. And we talked long and hard about whether we wanted to include those things, but we, we have. I think given that the poem is so predicated on the tension between those religions, I think it was important to do it. Um, and hopefully we've done a sort of respectful job of it. The, the early church, the early tr Christian church is absolutely fascinating and well worth studying if you're interested in history it's really really in, it's nothing like the church is now uh which is again really interesting in in the game we call it the church rather than christianity we don't use the term christianity in world if you like as a sort of just to give it that little bit of a remove because it's not the modern church um but that's something to read up on uh, in your own time um but but when you have just one player and one gm if your hero is for example sort of if you had a group you get you can get tension within the group you know that sort of elf dwarf thing where it's like i'm not getting in the boat with the dwarf and the whole session sort of the wheels fall off. i i'm um, getting in the boat with the christian <laughs> yeah <laughs> whereas when you've got one player you can focus on what the, the player really helps set the tone for the whole campaign and what the what one player wants to explore like we we've we have a little discord community um and very nice it is too hello discord people i'm sure hopefully some of them are watching um and we're getting loads of games reported that they're playing and they're all quite different you know people are exploring like what it means to be a hero um there are some really emotional games that i'm absolutely loving because because the player controls this little set of npcs that are their followers and it's up to you really how much you invest in that i would quite like people to be invested in their followers as as characters and you know to give them a bit of personality some of our players are really like they've really gone to town on that um and and they're very upset there was fairly recently big and big uh well-loved follower died in a campaign that was being reported very emotional business um so yeah that's lovely lovely to see it's an interesting um, thing to build up drama rather than have your character die you have a, an npc a follower you attach to die so it's still still very strong and meaningful this death but it doesn't stop yeah. the game it's still going it it's yeah, I, you, you... It reminds of Final Fantasy also a bit. You have this little group of people, you have your favorites, you leveled up everyone yeah. and you move them along. And it's, it's come, it gets quite interesting. There's been various scenes that we've played through in sort of development and play testing and, and we're hearing back. And again, it's lovely to hear back from people that are playing the game um, that there are some situations where it, it's almost like I, I'm I'm sort of giving you the simplified version, but like somebody has got to die. You know, the way the mechanics are falling, damage is going to be given to somebody and it's going to be a follower right a follower is going to kind of sacrifice himself and you have to choose who it is from your roster who is going to be you know slain um and there's there's a interestingly there's a sort of mechanical quirk where you actually as a hero you gain xp if your followers are slain you sort of learn from it and grow <laughs> from it so it, it, there's some really interesting tensions there. And if you've invested a lot, also between adventures, your downtime activity as a player is journaling what your followers get up to to basically justify the advances they get in becoming, they get new gifts, they become more powerful and experienced like your hero does. But you, you write their adventures in between. Um, and eventually they can actually step up and become heroes in their own right. So you could play a generational game where you would swap, you would retire your hero and become, start playing one of the, the your followers as a hero. Um, and yeah, people get really attached to them, which I absolutely love. I love that. I'm so pleased. I feel like we achieved something we set out to do with that. Because you never know. You never know if someone will just use them like, you know, paper soldiers to, to sort of soak damage on behalf of their hero and they won't care about them. But that's not you know, human beings are pretty good at caring, aren't they? It's interesting how it's sort of going full circle because you had a uh, uh, war gaming and then, oh, what if we mm. play a, a bunch, an army, but there's a hero oh, on top yeah. of the army and yeah. then we do chainmail. What about if we play only the hero and then chainmail becomes Dungeons and Dragons and other role-playing games? What if we play only one character? And, and now you're going back, yeah. what if a role-playing game <laughs> with just two players 
Yeah, it's like what I remember, but forget about it. Yeah. But each of them have a group of people. Yeah, <laughs> yeah they got great. See, because you have you have a ship. Every hero has a ship because the setting of the Whale Road, as as it's termed in Beowulf, the Whale Road, which is sort of the Baltic Sea, the North Sea, and all the land around it. Um, in that setting, every hero has a ship to get from A to B. So even you know, right at first level, you get a ship and you have a crew. Um, and the crew are also, you know, your responsibility. They they don't really feature in very much rule in very much rules stuff. We decided very early on we're not making a sort of sailing simulator, and we didn't want to micromanage the sailors on your ship. But you you have a much more vested interest in the actual your sort of war band of companions. You know, they they're interesting. The sailors that that make the ship run. They sort of mutter in the background sometimes. Sometimes you have to make decisions concerning them, but they're not. They very, very rarely take a foreground role um, in any adventure. But yeah, you get you've got a whole sort of. Well, the interesting thing is, it's like the hero business. At the end of every adventure, of course, there's treasure, and then you have to dole it out. The the sort of in in the mythic world of the Anglo-Saxons, the good rulers are called ring givers, you know, and you give out the treasure and you have to pay. Basically, you're paying your followers and you've got to pay for your uh, the upkeep of your ship. And it almost becomes like a business that you've got to keep <laughs> going. And there's mechanical consequences if you don't pay your followers or you pay. You have to pay the followers by how many gifts they have. They expect pretty much a pound of treasure per gift they possess. But if some of your followers are a bit too um sort of what's the word uh precocious and they're too good and there's too big a pay gap within your crew of, of followers then then that starts to create problems and and the ones that are getting paid less can get a bit sullen and, and not <laughs> help you as much so it's quite you know you've got to you, you, the, the the poor hero has to keep an eye on the the books you know at the end of the event <laughs> if you haven't found enough treasure someone ain't getting paid you got to pick who ain't getting paid you know or maybe you don't fix the ship this season you know maybe the ship doesn't get its rigging replaced so it's not quite as able at sea but you keep all your people happy <laughs> you, to you i love all that you can have your hr bot like okay there's no yeah. i in team <laughs> ulrich ulrich yeah. be a team player this is a yeah. this is not we are not pillaging today it's a team building exercise <laughs> <laughs> you know i'm good for it you know next month next month this time next year rodney it'll all come good yeah um yeah so yeah there's there's all that in there yeah very good a, a lot of game you know you got the forge in the dark you you got, you got well you got 5e mm -hmm. uh they, they build up a uh, uh, lines of different versions of their game would you ever consider doing i don't know the Aeneid or the iliad because that's also a bunch of people on a boat and having adventures yeah. across the sea yeah 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 or i mean there's so much that would would translate very easily and efficiently to to Odysseus because Be we spell Beowulf in caps and I think I mean we're also we've kicked around Gilgamesh um oh wow we need, which would be really really cool and something we haven't seen much of I think that would be really awesome um yeah but Odysseus would just be absolutely fantastic it fits perfectly um yeah, Beowulf sometimes gets called the Iliad of the North, though that's a pretty <laughs> poor. It's not quite right. It doesn't quite fit. But our our system would fit really beautifully for for those sort of Bronze Age Greek heroes. Um, right. Of course, we 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 have another project in progress called Helen and Stika with Ken Height, which, uh, whilst it's a slightly different ancient Greek period, I think it might be too confusing to do both. But we'll see. We'll mm. see because maybe it isn't. You know, maybe it isn't. Well, you confusing. you can sell on this. You can sell Odysseus calling Sorry. it the Beowulf of the South. <laughs> yeah, but, but yeah. Beowulf yeah, in sandals yeah. or something like that. Be, be really aggressive about Northern European culture. I don't think that would be a very appropriate thing to do. So but, you know, uh, get you some attention. You're you're an artist yourself, and mm. uh, you yep. take care of the art direction of your project. What what mm. was it like? So first of all, did you? Take care of all the arts. So I, I launched a slideshow of some some visuals, some miniatures as well. Oh. Uh, did, yeah, yeah, yeah. Did you did you take care of most of the art, or just did the art direction, or did you manage that on the, on your project? Any temptation so to micromanage? Oh, always, yeah. Of course, that's like, yeah. Um, I think I did most of it, and that I mean, primarily, that's sort of budgetary. Do you know what I mean? It's like I've I've got it on tap. I can spend the evening doing some artwork. It doesn't cost the project anything. Um, 
uh, we have our staff artist, Scott Purdy. He's our lead artist at uh, Handiwork Games. He uh, did, he handled all the monsters in Beowulf because he's absolutely brilliant at doing monsters. So uh, most of the monster artwork in the book is, is Scott Purdy. Uh, I got in touch with uh, an old friend of mine, actually absolutely brilliant artist, Jan Pospisil. He handled loads of NPCs and the drawings of the old gods in the book, and they're absolutely beautiful. Um, see, I'm tempted to like hold up this book and show it, but I think it will not do justice to the to the work. But yeah, oh look, there's this spread now. Let me see. Go on, let me see if I can do this. So that is right where we go. Yeah, there's Jan's work there, which is absolutely marvelous, marvelous stuff. Um, but yeah, I did loads of it. Um, Scott did loads of it. Uh, who else? Who else did artwork on that? I feel like I'm forgetting someone. I don't think I am. But I'm going to check the credits in case I've like crucially missed someone out, and then I'll be devastated afterwards. No, that's everyone. Yeah, it was just the three of us. And Paul Bourne, who does our graphics and layout, he did a whole lot of sort of graphic design work on it. Beautiful, beautiful stuff. And I see some miniatures as well. So you, you got mm. a whole range of miniatures. What what is that about? We'll do a little. So there's a little box set of miniatures that we uh, unlocked through the campaign. Well, it didn't unlock it through the campaign, but the campaign, uh, the support of our backers funded it. Um, we, we started the campaign with that. Um, yeah, that's that's a set of uh, nine 28 mil models. So nine heroes. They're all our pre-generated characters uh, from, we did a free scenario, still out there free, called uh, The Hermit Sanctuary. And we put out a couple of PDFs of pre-generated characters and then we made miniatures of them because we love miniatures and I know a guy that can sculpt them really well so we thought we'd be rude not to so yeah there's a miniature set um yeah the the hermit sanctuary was actually nominated for an any award which was pretty amazing um it wasn't our year in terms of winning anything but it got two nominations which was great um that's absolutely free it's on drive through now you can get it print on demand as well Look, I've got all my props here that you can get that's the that's the hermit sanctuary in print um, but yes, free in PDF. Just go and grab that, and you can play through a whole adventure, full-length adventure. So, what's the plan now? So, you, the prints are in a warehouse in Germany. So, I assume you're mm. going to ship it to yep. a lot of uh, happy yep. people who pre-ordered it. Uh, but what sort of is yep. the That's next right. step? Uh, is it coming to the shelf? Is it coming to Crossing Fingers UK Games Expo, uh, provided it's happening, or yeah, Dragon Meat. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, we will. We have a booth at UK Games Expo. Let, let's just assume Expo is happening because you know, um, let's cross our fingers. Yeah, we'll be there. We should have it there. Um, we do need to ship a lot of books to the US from Germany, so we. I want to make sure that our US backers are at least within, you know, very close to getting it before we start selling it anywhere else. Um, just, you know, basic manners for people. Um, and yeah, you can still get it from our website. We're talking to distribution now. Um, I don't want to say too much about that because, <laughs> you know, I don't want to, um, you know, jinx any deals. Hopefully uh, we have a bunch of retailers who backed the, the Kickstarter. So you'll be able to definitely get it through them um, and their stores. Um, what else is going on in terms of, we, we have a very active web store. Um, so you'll definitely be able to get it direct through there, even if we don't end up putting it through game stores. I would like to. We shall see. Um, what else is going on in terms of next? We're also doing something we unlocked in our Kickstarter is a series of adventures for Beowulf. And we're well through those. We unlocked five um, and they go to backers for free, but they're on sale on drive through. So there's plenty of adventure content um, already out for Beowulf, which is pretty cool. So there's plenty to be getting on with. The, the PDF is out for everyone to buy now. So um, yeah, that's out there. And then, yeah, after, after that, we're, we're sort of um, pausing on the Beowulf front. We'll keep doing the adventures, but then we have our game A-State, which is something completely different um, on sort of in every possible way, really. So what is that about? Next. I don't know anything about that one. So A-State is a sort of really niche cult hit from the early 2000s and the, there was a sort of British indie boom and A State was one of the early games from that. It was uh, created by Malcolm Craig and Paul Bourne who, who works for us at Handiwork. And it was a sort of dystopian sci-fi setting set in a place called The City, which is impossible to leave. It's like a city that just goes on forever. And it's very kind of, um, it, 
I'll keep saying the word dystopian sci-fi. It's not cyberpunk. It's not steampunk. It's like the last century of sort of a bit like Metropolis and High Rise, Ballard, all of those kind of influences are, are right there in A-State. Um, the sort of terrible grinding poverty at the bottom of society and the enormous slums. But then it's all run by these huge concerns at the top of society that are like enormous companies and enormous enormously wealthy and the rich live an entirely different life and the game is about the sort of tension between trying to make ends meet and trying to make your corner as we call it in the game your corner of the city better uh it uses blades in the dark uh oh. well, you know forged in the dark rules so yeah it's fiction first very different to to beowulf it's not it ain't nothing like D D. um so yeah it's it's very much a sort of group fiction exercise really cool we've been playing a few games a few bits and bobs from the setup you, you work together obviously as part of the game you work together creating your corner of the city um and your character you can build your characters together and, and decide how you're going to approach improving your corner against all the things that that come up against you whether it's the these huge sort of the concerns of these mega corporations as it were um or, or various other factors uh, within the city yeah it's really it's interesting stuff actually i'm very proud to be uh doing the second edition of it and and forged in the dark is such a great fit it was something from the first edition it was malcolm and paul's kind of first game really and i think they would do malcolm certainly would do the rules differently now he went on to make a game called uh cold city and then hot war which uh, really well thought of and he kind of hit his stride in creation mechanics later um, the, the A state had quite a traditional rule system, which I think Malcolm regrets to this day because he discovered all the stuff at the forge and so on. Just that little bit too late to incorporate it all in A state, but we're we're revisiting it and and with uh, Forged in the Dark, hopefully it's really gonna really gonna sing. Yeah, sounds great. Sounds like a good match. I actually have a copy of Cold Cities, one of my uh, oh, okay. my yeah. m many games that I I want and I need to run at some point, but I'm not yeah, quite it's really yet. Good. <laughs> the... Yeah, it's one of those, from that yeah time of sort of those first breakthroughs in in indie stuff of just a different sort of game. You know what I'm saying? It's yeah, like, really focusing the on an aspect thing. of a situation rather than try to. I have yeah, a, a laundry yeah. list of things that you try to cover. Okay, oh, what if I ride a horse? Oh, it doesn't matter in you know, Hercule but almost yeah, 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 yeah. you it's trust not, yeah. the other person. It's not huh? So, yeah, yeah, definitely. What's the schedule sort of for, for A State? Can people already pre register their interest? Is it coming to Kickstarter? Uh, do we have a program so, already? Um, so, again, there's a page on our website that you can learn a bit more about it. Um, also, it, we I'm hoping we will be on Kickstarter in June. Uh, we shall see, because again, we need to we need to get these Beowulf books to people before we can go back to Kickstarter to ask people for more support. You know, we want to make sure people have got all their stuff that they've already supported us for, um, or at least be you know just around the corner before we can launch a new campaign. So hopefully, June we should all be done and dusted with Beowulf by June. Better be. Um, so yeah, yeah, June time, uh, we will, of course, uh, be shouting from the rooftops when you'll be able to follow the, when the Kickstarter page is there for you to follow. It will be on Kickstarter. Um, yeah, give us a follow at, uh, at Games Handiwork on Twitter or we're on Facebook as well. And, and one of them other ones called Instagram. We've even got Pinterest. I don't talk about the Pinterest enough. It's quite good. Quite like Pinterest. It's very calm, isn't it? Pinterest com compared to everywhere else. <laughs> it's a, um, it's, it's <laughs> great. Yeah, yeah, indeed. I've not invested myself in Pinterest yet. I, I went the TikTok route yeah. instead. It's slightly more yeah, uh, yeah. wild. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's a bit more m movement on TikTok. Um, yeah, you must say, yeah, because Twitter's bonkers, isn't it? I found myself, I was having a good right? I mean, it was mostly, hopefully, from my side, it was good natured, but I was arguing with Gino Paco from um, GMS podcast i was uh, arguing with him yesterday about so like, that, the iliad yeah. or something and i was like i mean i discovered i think sort of my religion as it were is sort of the classics it's not really like religious i don't sort of believe in zeus or something but like yeah i was getting really touchy about it <laughs> and i'm like why am i what what but that's twitter isn't it, it makes you 
crazy. Yeah. Yeah, and you see things. Kind of express yourself. You see things and it just triggers you. I, I think the the thing that people are, don't quite realize with Twitter, it's really worth it, is to, you know, not even something you disagree with, but just things you don't want to in, engage about when you're on Twitter. Yeah. Uh, you've got the, the muted word functions and not just muting accounts, but selecting words and topics. And this way they, they don't yeah. show up on your feed. It's very important to curate yep. your Twitter feed so you... Yeah, you you don't you're not exposed to a, a, a lot of signals that you you don't really yeah. want when you go there. Uh, since you're into the the classical stuff, uh, I recommend mm. uh, an account on Twitter I quite like. It's classical studies memes for Hellenistic teens. Okay. And it's, it's oh yeah 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 I've heard of it. I don't know if I'm following it, but I've definitely seen stuff from it. Yeah. Well, if you follow me, I retweeted a bunch recently, and it's yeah. it's just very obscure references, uh, like yeah, references to uh, the oldest complaint letter, which is kept uh, it's it's tablet, which is kept in the British Museum, and uh, and Diogenes uh, saying, "Behold, the man uh, pointing to a." a a duck, uh, 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 a chicken he, he plucked. But yeah, I will mm -hmm. I will include links to uh, all of that in the description mm -hmm. of the episode and everything you mentioned. Uh, we're getting close to slowly to the one hour mark. Uh, uh, is there a topic mm. we didn't bring up that you'd like to discuss? Or? I think we've we've covered it pretty well. I think uh, yeah. Uh, we do loads of stuff, so it's well worth heading to our website. That's the main thing. If you, if anything we're talking about sounds interesting, then there's more of it at uh, handiwork.games. So yeah, go go head over there and check that out. We will be we have a very nice um, Discord community, which we will be throwing open a bit wider. We we've, we've sort of curated it quite carefully to to kind of backers really of, of our projects. Um, but we'll be opening up that up soon. I think next month probably we'll throw the doors open a bit further. And it'd be nice if people want to come and join us and have a bit of a chat about all of this kind of stuff. So, yeah. Amazing. Uh, and uh, criticize Paco, who's a friend of the show. <laughs> How about his yeah. views? Oh, about... I love Paco come so on. much. I love Paco. <laughs> what He's are you brilliant. saying? Paco. Or can I... you say that about Achilles <laughs> and the sticks? Do, do you That's know, nonsense. Yeah, do you know, the funny thing is, I always give Paco a hard time because, you know, he's, he fights the good fight, doesn't he, Paco? And he, he argues nonstop with people he deserve arguing with. And I'm always, you should, you know, pick your battles, Paco. Try and keep calm. <laughs> but then he mentioned the River Styx and I just went berserk. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, well, that'll teach me. <laughs> Who knew? Because I'm quite, I don't get into arguments online. I've got quite a good, I mean, I'm quite a, like, I get wound up by it, but I just don't say anything. You know? I just, I, you know, very, you know, poor show of bad mental health practice. I just, you know, clam it all up inside um but you know obviously paco just lets rip and more power to him but uh, yeah it was funny that i was like what are you talking about <laughs> <laughs> i hope he knows i was laughing while i was talking about it but i was surprised at my own passion about achilles and his nature as a hero and the river sticks not having any plot holes in it <laughs> I will include the link to the thread in the description because yeah i saw it yeah, uh, on my awesome. timeline and i was like wow yeah, that's, like, oh that's really God, out of character like for, for the two of them i mean yeah. you could tell it was in good nature when you you're aware of yeah. it of the two of you but it was like wow they, they really both care about what is going on. i want to go on his i want to go on his show to talk about that some more <laughs> and except, except of course in voice it would never we would never be like you know it wouldn't Exactly. I could arrange well, that, you know. Yeah, <laughs> I could I get on there. It's been a while. I, I could, you know, just yeah. have a clickbaity title like "Sticks Benevolent yeah, or win. Deadly?" <laughs> Question mark. <laughs> <laughs> With Paco from GMS Magazine and, uh, and John Oxen from yeah. Indie Work Games, <laughs> yeah, and I, I just, showdown. I just stream it, and I put the microphones on. And uh, I just stay silent, like, making faces behind the two of you. You know what? I, I sort of came to I came to the conclusion about twenty four hours later that, like, of course, Paco was talking about the whole thing in terms of sort of setting riff for gaming, and I was getting all annoyed because it's like you're talking about it like with gamer logic, and the river sticks does not involve gamer logic. It's like mythic, so you know how <laughs> dare you? 
think that way but obviously the whole thing really obviously was supposed to be about games but i don't know what well you took sort of... you took a poem and you turned it in fifth edition which is not yeah, exactly well, the most yeah. flourish the really upsetting thing about it <laughs> <laughs> like one massive hypocrite what's yeah, the stat that, block the problem, yeah. for the river sticks yeah. so now you said you would do odysseus you need to do at some point the river sticks yeah. and you need the well, stat we'll block put that in yeah that's all got to go in hasn't it now to stand behind to completely do a 180 degree about face but that's sort of appropriate isn't it for twitter and 2021 you kind of get into an argument from one angle and then just six weeks later you're publishing a game from the other angle that's how it works i think amazing (laughs) well on that good words uh i think you already mentioned where people can find you again i will include everything in the description of the episode uh people and in the description of the episode, we'll also include a link to my own game, my first ever game, Paris Gondo, The Life-Saving Magic mm. of Inventoring, which is a game which helps you. It's for all the adventurers with a strong desire to declutter their loot and to banish encumbrance forever. So uh, nice. please go check that out. Uh, thank you so much, John. Uh, it was a pleasure. And uh, we need to hook up again to, to talk about historical stuff uh, even more. Yeah, yeah, I love it. It's like, I hope people don't get bored because I'd talk about it all oh, day. Oh, me yeah, never. Like... History for me, uh, it's it's actually on the ongoing team on the, the role list. I'm a big proponent of using playing more role playing games in historical settings and, and mm-hmm. approach them as yeah. a an act of curiosity. And rather than we, we tend to be very, oh no, I cannot be in history because. This is the way things were. And you're like, no, that's the way they were described in the 19th century and in Hollywood movies. That's not yes. exactly how they were. Yes, exactly. And we actually don't know. Yeah. So feel free. Just, you know, <laughs> Denmark was there yeah. rather than there. It's fine. You can do that. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Well, yeah, very much so. Good. Okay. Excellent. Good. <laughs> Cheers. And uh, thank you very much to Danny Ware for setting this up also. Yeah, uh, yeah, she yeah. should be a guest. I think you're going to. Yeah. at some point she should yeah get danny on but yeah she deserves a show absolutely in her own right really yeah Gosh. She, she's a bit less far so i'm hopeful that we could meet in person in an outdoor wow, setting yeah, with hand yeah. sanitizer and and record this way but yeah uh thanks she johnny did. thanks to the people in the the chat room and people watching this and uh yeah see you soon bye bye